The kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, to every man according to his several ability. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? All these works that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And of whom men have committed much, of him will they ask the more. Who is sufficient for these things? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It's amazing to me in reading this devotional today because I was looking at that statement, the manifold grace of God, the that every man would profit with all, and as every man has received the gift, that they would receive as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I think about that, and I run into a lot of people on the internet lots of times that really don't share much grace. I wonder whether or not they know what grace is. Because people sometimes take this whole teaching about grace, and sometimes I wonder if they've gotten off track into thinking that because Jesus died on the cross, that now suddenly they don't need grace. They are righteous, so they act more righteous than they are and expect others to be more righteous than they possibly could be. Because I see this attitude coming out a lot that because the world is passing away and that there seems to be so much going wrong in their life or wrong in the world, they want to make someone to blame for what's going to happen to the world, which we know by prophecy that we are in the last days. There is absolutely no doubt about it. There's a new uh, false teaching coming out that's going to say that it's a hundred years away. No, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go back a hundred years, you know. There were people saying it then, too. <laughs> no, we're in it. As soon as Israel became a nation, that's it, period. Sorry, end of story. You're counting down now. You're in the last. But there will come a time of peace where people will be deceived and then they'll begin to believe in this hundred year theory. So be careful. But besides that, there's also this attitude of somehow you don't need grace or you don't need to share grace. But I got a good one for you because you see, if you don't forgive people, you won't be forgiven. Jesus said it. And part of getting grace is to be able to give grace. And I'm going to say something that maybe you won't agree with because it's not a direct scripture. But I think I'm on pretty solid ground saying this. If you don't give grace, you won't get grace. Bottom line. The facts are, the manifold grace of God was given to you for a purpose. To profit the people that you have within your ministry, within your life, within your realm or circle of friends, within your contact areas, whether that be through social media, whether it be in personal contact at business, at work, at play, in your realm of friendships that you've developed through corporate or you know interpersonal relationships that you've experienced throughout life. If you're not taking God into all of that, I wonder if you've frustrated grace. I wonder if you are saved. You know, People like to say, once saved, always saved. But let me clar some, clarify something for you. Once saved, always saved applies to those that are saved. Nobody knows who that is. Nobody, except God. When you get there, you were saved. If you didn't get there, you weren't saved in the first place. That's how the scriptures are written. They're written that those that are saved are always saved and were saved from the foundations of the world. It's written that way. Yep, they were. From the beginning, they already knew who they were. They didn't know, but God knew who they were. And then it also says in scripture, and those that weren't saved, whether they looked like it, whether they acted like it, whether they talked like it, whether they appeared to have fruit, weren't saved in the beginning in the first place. That's a scary thought. Because you see, both extremes fit, and they're not contradictory. It just simply means God can see the heart, and we can't. We look on the outward things and we say, oh, well, we can make a judgment call. No, you can't. You discern 
and ask God to lead you in the way that you should go, and you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, encouraging the brethren with mercy and grace so that it would be applied to you. But frankly, I'll be the first one to tell you, if you're not extending mercy and grace to people, if you're not forgiving your brothers, sisters, and you know, like some of the heathen, you know, and some of the people that need forgiveness, you know, if you're not going out there and helping people, you know, like the poor and the needy and the homeless and those without, I question your salvation, and you better. Because there is a time where Jesus says, hey, depart from me, I never knew you. Those times are terrifying in one way. If you don't have a relationship with God today, that could be a very scary thought to have to trust it for tomorrow. Because you're either going to suddenly become a fanatic on wanting to do all these good works to make sure your salvation and assure yourself of great reward, or you're going to become a legalist and start attacking other people to make yourself feel more righteous than you really are. You see, I'm a sinner. I know that. I know, and I've said it very obviously on this video and video, and I've said it to myself, and I say it to my wife, I say it to my friends. Hey, I'm a sinner. Given five minutes alone without the Spirit of God or without God really convicting me and without me actually fighting this battle day by day, I'd go out and sin no problem. I, I would jump into it, dive into it, and wallow in it. Matter of fact, I'd probably backslide forever. Except that God is at work with me, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. He operates in me because I want him to daily. I ask him to please take this away from me. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? The good that I would, I do not, that which I would not, I do. Who shall deliver me? Praise the Lord that Jesus shall. Because you turn your life over to him daily. You turn your life over to him in every trial and tribulation, in every circumstance of your life. You seek for grace, though it's been given to you. Don't make a mistake. You're not re-crucifying. You're not redoing the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But let's just say the applicable process that is at work in you to present you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy and determination of your eternal reward or your eternal destiny, that consideration is in Jesus' hands. And I would rather find myself daily talking, walking, and being with Him in a merciful way and a loving way and a way that God says that Jesus was acceptable in His sight than to come across as some kind of righteous Pharisee or Christian who's out condemning people. Because, you see, if you want to be saved, you need to offer salvation to people. If you want to assure yourself of that confidence of salvation, I wouldn't go being real religious about it. I'd be going real merciful and considerate about it. Because in these last days, there's a lot of people that are very deceived. And they're leading a lot of people in deception. Going after things of the world and things that are humanistically very, very impressive. Looks good, tastes good, feels good, acts like it's the Spirit of God, seems like it's the Spirit of God, moves like the Spirit of God. But is it what Jesus said? Is it what Jesus did? Would Jesus do that? The truth is, you can't compromise the Sermon on the Mount at all in loving your enemies. You can't compromise salvation to another person whom should you should be praying for. We talked about and written about so many times about how people, right now, the Christians are being completely stumbled. It's almost as though the entire church body just went falling flat on its face over the election a few years back. And because of that, they can't seem to recover from it. They can't get over their pride and ego of thinking their Christian nation is not what they thought it was. And that they're not citizens of this nation, they're citizens of heaven. And that the reality of what God sets up in the nations is His sovereign choice. And we need to accept His will in our nation and then pray accordingly. Because if you're not, you're not acknowledging thy will be done, not my will. And that's what we need to do today. We need to look at Jesus and say, Lord, have I fallen far? Have I fallen far from grace? Do you know my name anymore? I love you, but do 
I really have some of this stuff inside that may cause me to be distant from you in some way? God, help me. God, heal me. God, hear me. God, forgive me. Hey, Daniel, pray that. 